Hello, everyone. What a pleasure it is and an honor to be here at the Mount. And, uh, you know, midsummer, midday, and unlike in Edith Wharton's time, we have, you know, electric zephyrs <laughs> providing us with this wonderful uh, breeze. And um, I'm, I really am thrilled to be able to be here and, and to share with you some of the things that I discovered after I was uh, invited to speak. Uh, here at the Mount. At first, I thought, um, gosh, Julia Morgan and Edith Wharton, there, are there really any parallels between them? Because Julia Morgan was known for um, her reticence to be interviewed, and um, her, she, said, she said that buildings should speak. Her buildings should speak for themselves. And of course, as we know, Edith Wharton was uh, so socially connected, and also um, she was such you know, not only a, a, a superb communicator uh, with her many novels, but of course, the books that are still the cornerstones of any uh, study of Italian villas and the decoration of houses. Um, and so she was didactic, and she was you know teaching and she was sharing her ideas, so I thought, oh boy, you know, um, the, the the legend about Julia Morgan is that we would never know anything about her private life because she uh, burned all of her uh, papers, and um, that is not so. She actually saved a great deal, but I was honored to be the first person to really be able to work on uh, her papers and and what um, my they're at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, um, and in the special collections of their library archive. And my research assistant and I were able to transcribe all the letters and diaries, and we came up with 800,000 words that were either from her or to her. So she's anything but, uh, you know, uh, unknown. And but there was a great deal I found out uh, that I didn't know by this process. And indeed, there turned out were some connections between Julia Morgan and Edith Wharton. I know for I don't know if they ever met. Um, I'm not sure it's likely because, um, and I'm going to call, the, of course they would have been, you know, Mrs. Wharton and Miss Morgan, but I'm going to get familiar here and call them Edith and Julia just for economies of words sake. But um, when, when Edith did her seminal work, which preceded um, Italian villas, it was called Italian Background, uh, Italian Backgrounds. It was her first sort of travel book and it was really, she was describing people as well as places, came out in 1904. And, um, the illustrations for it were done by Julia Morgan's best friend's brother. His name was Ernest Prichotto, which is how you say P-E-I-X-O-T-T-O, -T -T -O, Prichotto. And um, there's no way that, Ju that Julia didn't know <laughs> about Edith because that was such an impressive commission. Ernest was a Californian. Um, his sister Jessica and Julia had journeyed together to France and uh, stayed in touch for the rest of their uh, lives, according to letters from you know Julia's mother to Julia when she was away and things. So um, anyway, they definitely, uh, Julia definitely knew of Edith, though I don't know if, if it was vice versa. Julia left Paris right before Edith arrived, really. Um, but you know, they also had a similar uh, worldview. They were both so, um, it, it, while Edith was self-taught, uh, but they were both so well-traveled and they both made the cornerstone of their art be the, the architectural language of the past, but skillfully blended together with a special emphasis on Italy and, of course, on France. So um, as, as uh, Sue was saying, you probably know Julia Morgan best through San Simeon, her, her commission with William Randolph Hearst. Um, it was an extraordinary, it would be extraordinary today, uh, but, but in 1919, when it began, it was job number 503 for Julia Morgan. And she designed 700 buildings, so she designed hundreds of other things while it was underway, and construction continued for 28 years until 1947. And when we consider that she, when she began it, could not vote in a presidential election, it's a reminder, you know, of how, uh, of what a trailblazer she was. But it was this marvelous collaboration between um, architect and client. Um, so that's what she's best known for, but it was an honor for me to be able to not only tell that story, she and William Randolph Hearst exchanged 2,462 letters and telegrams, all of which are part of this transcription. And the, the goal is to, when we finish it, to put it online 
And um, so scholars from all over the world are going to be able to study Julia Morgan because she really deserves that kind of attention. She was so remarkable. Um, but uh, uh, there are also diaries, you know, which, which I had never seen. So it was an honor to be able to tell not just the story of her buildings, which has been done by some people before, but really the story of her private life and the, and the, the many adversities um, that she faced and conquered. So I, she's a visual artist, and of course I had to have a visual artist to document her extraordinary life, and I was very fortunate. I hired this man, his name is Alex Vertikoff, and um, he is a superb photographer. And this is just an example. This actually didn't even get into the book, but um, this is um, a, an example of his work. It's a, it's a staircase in one of uh, Julia's uh, women's clubs, of which she literally built more than a dozen. This is the Berkeley City uh, Women's Club. Um, but he took so many brilliant photographs of her work, and um, he wasn't able to, we weren't able to use them all in the book, so he has a website. It's called vertikoff.com, and if you go on it, you'd be able to see a slideshow of a lot of the other images that he took that we weren't um, able to use. So he really understands um, uh, space, he really understands composition. This is a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a columbarium that Julia designed called the Chapel of the Chimes. That's a mausoleum, but for crematory urns. It's a magnificent building um, in North Oakland. And uh, that is a, f a font, but she designed the entire thing. It's very large, and Alex can even make a, a two-dimensional photograph of his look three-dimensional. That's how uh, gifted he is. So who was Julia Morgan? Well, she was a native Californian. And a, a thing that she and Edith had in common was, I think, this ability to understand and convey what scholars call the genius loci. You know, where they are from has everything to do with what they have done. And she was very proud to be a native Californian. She said she considered herself fortunate to be practicing architecture in the place where she grew up. She was born in San Francisco in 1872. And uh, so Edith was 10 years older. I don't know if I said that. Uh, Edith was born in 1862. Um, but uh, anyway, and she was rare in this because, of course, California had its own phase of the arts and crafts movement. It came later than it came on the East. But so many architects who moved there to be a part of that movement in the first part of the 20th century, Charles and Henry Green were born in Cleveland, Ohio and grew up in St. Louis. Uh, Bernard Maybeck, who was a native New Yorker. Um, you know, they, they weren't, she was the only native um, Californian and it really, the, the relationship between uh, setting and structure colored all of her work, and that it's, you know, I, I, I lecture all over the country, but I'm seldom anywhere that, that is as carefully thought out and beautifully preserved uh, and deeply personal as is the mount where we see that exact same thing, uh, where the structure and the setting have been um, wedded together. So even though she was a Californian, um, her family had East Coast ties. Her mother, Eliza Parmalee Morgan, uh, went to Brooklyn Heights Seminary, and, and Eliza's family were well off. Her uh, father, Julia's grandfather, was a cotton broker uh, before and after the Civil War. And um, uh, El Eliza married another uh, New Yorker from Brooklyn Heights. His name was Charles Bill Morgan. Actually, he was distantly related to J.P. Morgan and the Morgan banking family, but it doesn't look like they ever had any connection to each other, but it's a distant uh, family connection. Um, and while... Uh, Eliza was full of, of vim and, um, you know, definitive energy. She wrote to Julia once. Um, Julia was away on a college trip, and the stationary heading said, Vincit qui patitur, which means he conquers who suffers. And what she instructed her daughter was, um, I hope you're having a good time. Let a spirit um, of duty animate you, should you be inclined to droop. Julia was seldom inclined to droop. But it is true, I think, that she got her dynamism from Eliza. Um, and and um, Charles, had he, he had a lot of goals, but he was very um, often unsuccessful in bringing them into fruition. Julia's nephew, who knew her best, oh, I forgot. Um, another, thing, another way that they're not the same is that, of course, Edith Wharton had uh, a marriage, uh, you know, uh, uh, relationships with others. Uh, Julia Morgan, uh, it's been speculated, was a lesbian, and, and there's no evidence of that in these 800,000 words. Um, as a matter of fact, she was so busy being an architect and and also caring for many members of her family who had health problems and for which she bore kind of the major uh, responsibility of, of care uh, most of her life. 
Uh, so what she was really wedded to, you know, was architecture. But um, anyway, uh, Eliza and Charles were married on Remsen Street in, in Brooklyn Heights and uh, in, in Richard Upjohn's church, Trinity Church. That's where Julia was um, baptized as well. And I'm going to be quoting Julia's nephew. His name uh, was Morgan North, and so that's confusing. Um, named, uh, but we'll, we'll just call him North um, for short. But one of the things he said about his grandfather, Julia's sister's son, um, he said about his grandfather, Charles was into nails, sugar, machinery, voting machines, anything that didn't work he was in. So um, the Morgan family were largely subsidized by the Parmelees at, and this you know, wealth. Um, but Julia spent a lot of time in Brooklyn Heights, one whole year, as a matter of fact, when she was uh, about age seven. But she went back to New York very frequently. Now, the, their house was at 63 Remsen Street. Uh, uh, not there anymore. The Bossard Hotel replaced it about 1900. But this is 45 Remsen Street, and it's a back window. So, you know, the, these houses of Brooklyn, Brooklyn Heights was the most elegant suburb of Manhattan, right? And um, so the, she grew up visiting a house that was five stories, uh, a five-story brownstone full of magnificent architectural detail. And she also lived in a beautiful home. And so she wasn't nowhere near as wealthy as the Jones family and, and Edith Wharton. And matter of fact, she, Julia didn't care at all about money and um, divided profits among her staff anytime she had a good year. But, um, but anyway, she did grow up in comfort, you know, in, in up, up, upper class comfort. She went to Oakland High School when it was such a renowned school that, that um, students were moving in from around the state and living in boarding houses to, to, to go there. And she lived here. Uh, this house was built for the Morgans in 1885 at 754 14th Avenue. And it's likely, at the, Julia was 13, it's likely that, um, that Eliza f uh, funded it because Albert had died a few years before and Eliza moved from Brooklyn Heights to California and lived with them and didn't die until Julia was 17. So in 1885, um, it's likely that Eliza paid uh, for this home, which you can see has a feeling of East Lake stick around the windows, uh, but, but also the, the grand touches of, of uh, Queen Anne. Julia lived in this house for 40 years. She moved in when she was 13. She didn't move out until, until 1925. And um, when she moved to San Francisco, where she lived for the rest of her life. So it, she, and she lived, you know, back then, if you didn't get married, you lived, you lived at home. And, 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 and even her sister, who did marry, uh, moved into the third floor. So the Morgans were a very close-knit um, family. And, uh, but I think that she was informed by growing up around natural and created beauty. And because I have this terrific um, research assistant, she was able to find in... Um, this line drawing from a newspaper in 1892, this is the Morgan family living room. And uh, so it, it, it's pride in, their pride and joy was this um, archway, you know, that um, f surrounded the fireplace. It was redwood, you know, this being California. And then there were portieres on both sides of it, and then the little Ingleside seats, you know, those little seats up against the wall that got you close to the fireplace. You can see it has an arts and crafts touch with um, you know, the diamond, the, the, the tile uh, patterning. They had, it had gasoliers, built-in bookcases, you know, a lovely, ha handsome home. And um, because we had that, we were able to identify this. This is Eliza in that living room, Julia's mother. So um, it had pocket doors and a back uh, partition area. That's where Eliza's sitting, working on a quilt square. And uh, looking out, there's an American flag draped over the mirror artfully. There's um, Hans Hoffman's uh, print of Christ in Gethsemane, very famous painting that was um, m reproduced in prints in, in 1890. But you see the built-in bookcases, um, the number of books, and such a plethora of objets d'art that some of them, and picture frames, are sitting on the floor, <laughs> as is a vase of flowers. So she definitely grew up in comfort. We're not exactly sure why she decided to become an architect. It could be because uh, her second cousin, Lucy Latimer, married a New York architect who attained quite a bit of prominence. His name was Pierre Lebrun. And maybe you know his MetLife Tower building, which still stands on uh, Madison Avenue today. Pierre was, and Lucy became real mentors um, to Julia. We're not exactly sure. But anyway, she went to the University of California. And this is what it was, five buildings in a field, you know. And um, that, that she went there from 1890 to 1894, and they didn't have an architecture division. She, she uh, ended up studying civil engineering, uh, and, uh, which was 
the closest she could come to architecture. Uh, but she graduated uh, with honors, and of course she was very rare. All her life, Julia Morgan was usually, you know, the only female in kind of whatever setting <laughs> uh, she appeared in. But right after she graduated, this man arrived, and that's this brilliant New Yorker from Greenwich Village, Bernard Mabet. His father was um, a furniture maker. I think that Ben, who came out to ca first Louisville and then California, I think that he got some of his wonderful, visionary, um, fantastical in the literal sense of sense of architecture because he, I think he might have thought of it with, as possessing the same delicacy of, as furniture. But um, even though he was, you know, he wore handmade pants, the waistband of which ended at his armpit, and and he was. <laughs> called a freak unfairly by a lot of his colleagues. But anyway, he was very good he, at convincing people to uh, do things, or, or as he said, dream big, to dream big. And he was able to convince William Randolph Hearst's mother, Phoebe Apperson Hearst, to fund the first worldwide international architecture competition, which happened, you know, Phoebe had um, was born in Franklin County, Missouri. She was 19 when she married George Hurst. He's a 41-year-old miner who'd made his first big strike and then came home to the Merrimack River Valley, uh, married this uh, young woman, and they came west. And William Randolph Hearst, their only child, was born in 1863. Phoebe became a doyenne uh, and a great philanthropist, and she knew that education had saved her, and she wanted to uh, support it. As a matter of fact, she wanted to pay for Julia Morgan's education, and uh, Ben had introduced them, Bernard Maybeck, and uh, Julia turned her down but thanked her, said, you know, your faith is enough of a gift to me, but certainly Phoebe did stay in touch, and she was the agency by which Julia Morgan and WR met, though we're not exactly sure how. But anyway, he, um, she wanted to build a mining building. George Hurst had died. She had uh, inherited his $20 million, which in 1891 um, was $540 billion. Comstock, silver, anaconda, copper, homestake gold. And so um, Ben saw his moment. He'd been to the Ecole des Bazaars, and he knew that you, just like Edith, and that's another thing, is that so many of the tenets that she espoused, and, and with Ogden Codman and herself as well, uh, were, were the tenets of the Ecole des Bazaars, you know, where the, the greatest school for architects that was founded in 1648. So um, anyway, Ben had graduated. He said, well, yes, you could do that, Mrs. Hurst, but don't you think it'd be better if you funded a competition to design the entire campus, and then we could figure out where it's best to put the mining building? She said yes, wrote a blank check. So um, he convinced her to do that, and more that, moreover, he convinced her <laughs> to commission this. Speaking of dreamscapes, this was Phoebe's getaway home in, um, on the north of, um, of end, end of California, the base of Mount Shasta on the Oregon border, and it's called Wintoon, W-Y-N-T-O-O-N. Of course, it looks like it was lifted straight off the Rhine River, and it's this magnificent building of, of green, blue-green tile and massive stone, seven stories high. So this was um, where uh, Phoebe would go to relax among the, the forests of Northern California. So Ben, ben designed this for Phoebe. Uh, he oversaw that competition, and he also convinced Julia Morgan that she had the ability to compete at the Ecole des Bazaars. Now, it had been founded in 1648 as kind of a feeder school for the artisans that would eventually build uh, Versailles, you know. And since 1648, they had never admitted a woman. But uh, there was a rumor about that they were going to admit women to the painting, painting and sculpture departments. And so uh, Ben urged her to go over and take a chance. And um, and so she did it. She traveled with the woman I mentioned before, Jessica Pichardo, who spent a year at the Sorbonne, studying the Sorbonne. So here's Julia in this uh, Paris apartment. She arrived in um, 1896 and commenced uh, auditing because though the women couldn't be admitted, they were, they had been given the one little, like the toe in the door, you know, the concession to audit, sit in on classes. Um, and so Julia would uh, cross the floor of this um, central hallway at the Ecole. Of course, back then it was full of life-size plaster casts of magnificent um, sculptures, but she would audit um, classes. In 1897, uh, the women did get a chance in painting and sculpture to be admitted, and the men rioted. They rioted. They followed the girls out of the campus. They chased them all over Paris. I mean, it was a full-on riot, and they, many of them were arrested. So, um, you know, it had been uh, very much a male culture and as I said, it had been established for so long with a very sophisticated bunch of traditions of hazing that really make our fraternities look like old hat. And um, it is true that, that Julia, who was uh, allowed to go into a studio, she wasn't admitted to the university, but 
Um, she joined an atelier. That's what you did. You, you joined a studio where an architect kind of oversaw your work, and you practiced to do the arduous examinations which were uh, needed to get into the Ecole. Most people did not succeed in the latter. So she sent this letter to um, Pierre and Lucy. She's at M Marcel de Monclos, is the uh, uh, young architect whose salon she's practicing in. And you see on the left there it says um, men. On the right it says uh, court. At the top it says stores, meaning, you know, supplies. And then just below that it says empty, Bud, and me. Now, Bud was um, Catherine Bud, another woman, and she, she never took the exam. She never entered the Ecole. But she, they, so there were two women there. But if you look at this diagram, you'll see that what the young women had to do was climb up their stairs and go through the gauntlet of the men's studio to get to their um, little cubicles. And Julia wrote to Pierre and Lucy, one man is very gentlemanly, but the rest could have been replaced with no difficulty. <laughs> so there's no doubt that she was hazed. And uh, one of her classmates later said she had water poured over her head. She was pushed on the, uh, off the ends of benches. These were time-honored harassment techniques of for all, you know, these, uh, these ateliers were funded by the men, the students, and they were all like 20, you know. So it was very difficult for an American girl, but she, um, you know, took it in stride and persevered, and she did love, and here we get back to another connection with Edith, she did love Paris, and her favorite place was Notre Dame, and she hated to have her photograph taken, and, but she had this photo taken for her family standing at Notre Dame, and what she loved the best about it was the gargoyles, and what she liked to do was climb up to the towers and look down on what she called these half-wicked, half-fiend gargoyles, and imagine all that they had seen as they looked down on Paris and the river and watched the city grow over the centuries. Um, so she really, uh, she knew a lot about architecture, but she was self-educated in that sense of traveling in, uh, all, all through France. And um, her brother Avery, uh, who was four years younger, he joined her in 1898, and then she could go out at night, you know, which she couldn't do before. They saw Sarah Bernhardt in, uh, play Hamlet. They went to the opera, you know. Um, he stayed with her for two years, though he never was admitted. Julia took the examination in the, in the fall of 1897, and it was so arduous, and she didn't pass, but she did very well. She scored 43 out of a 400 candidates. Uh, she took it again um, the following spring, and um, it was just a matter of course that you were going to fail the first time. But she thought she'd done better, and she was so surprised and upset that she did a lot worse. And she ran into de Monclo, and she said, what, what was wrong? And he looked at her funny, and he said, the score. The judges had artificially lowered her score. And I don't think they would have done that if she wasn't going to be admitted. But they said, we don't want to encourage young girls. And so she wrote to Pierre and Lucy. She said, you know, it's sort of funny in a way. I understand. She said, but I'll do it again just to show them that the young girls are not discouraged. And that's who she was all of her life. And um, so you see her here. The, Avery, her brother, must have taken this uh, portrait. That's the Trocadero um, uh, Exhibition Hall in the Seine. It's just kind of in the middle. Uh, so uh, she did persevere. And But 1897 uh, was, was really a, a, a banner year because she would have been admitted to the Ecole de Bazaar. That's the year, you know, that, that with Ogden Codman Jr., Edith wrote the Decoration of Houses, 1897. But as it was, she had to basically just embarrass them. She took the exam four times. The last time, she was 13th out of 390, you know. And she wrote modestly to Pierre and Lucy, you know, the judgment it is, is in, and I am, I am uh, 13th, 10 French, two foreigners. She said, it is not much, but took quite a little effort. And she said, I wouldn't have kept on, if, except for a sense that it was a sort of test, in a way, of work itself, overcoming its natural difficulties that made it seem a thing that really had to be won. And uh, so it, it made worldwide news when she was admitted in 1898. And then the work begins, you know. And, and just like for these examinations, what they would do, you, you took classes, but you advanced through the program by um, entering competitions. And so they'd lock you in a room, and for 12 hours, you would do what they said, design a museum or design a theater for a palace. You did the sketch. It's called an esquisse. You turned it in, went away for six weeks, and came back with projets rendus, these rendered projects in plan section and elevation, these magnificent drawings. And if, in any way, your final drawings diverged from that initial uh, sketch you had submitted, you were disqualified. And if you, and this con was constant, <clears throat> more than a dozen uh, uh, competitions a year. And if um, you won, you only, got, you only got one point, 
and you had to amass 26 points. And there was another thing. You had to do it before you turned 30. Every single person was ejected when they turned 30 from the École des Beaux-Arts. And um, so she didn't get in until she was 27. And if, if Americans graduated, which a lot of them didn't, a lot of them just sat in on some classes, and you know, but if they graduated, it took six years. She did it. She did it in three. And she, just before, uh, th that, uh, that was her final prize-winning drawing, as a matter of fact, that put her over the, the point level. Now, she didn't get a diploma, and she was not listed as among their graduates, because to get that, she would have had to spend a year as an, um, a tr an, uh, an intern, effectively, in an architect's office. Well, she could have done that if she'd been admitted in 1897. But uh, they called it a certificat. She got the kind of next lowest rung, but she's not even recognized as a full graduate because of that. Um, but um, anyway, it made worldwide press when she got that certificat. The Jackson Mississippi Courier said that her child uh, work of block houses was genius. The London Pall Mall Gazette said, um, of course, she won't really practice architecture, but, um, but uh, Miss Morgan has been very um, surprised and upset by all the attention she's received. That was true. You know, suddenly, at 30, she comes back to California. She's world famous. And uh, she and much had changed in the six years she'd been away because of Phoebe's competition. The winning architect whom they selected was John Galen Howard, another New Yorker. And Julia immediately in late 1902 went to work in his office. And she was the construction superintendent for this Greek theater. I don't know if the man standing all there by himself is William Randolph first, but it well may be because it was he who provided the money for this Greek theater to the university as a way of supporting his mother's philanthropy. So maybe he met Julia there. And if it wasn't there, um, it would have been, and, and let's see, 1903, W.R. Was, was 40. Um, and, of course, a newspaper magnate had been given the San Francisco Examiner when he was 24, and he parlayed that into 28 newspapers, 14 magazines, eight radio stations, two film companies. So he was a real media mogul with political ambitions that were often, you know, um, un, went unconsummated. Un but, but anyway, he was a very prominent man. And if she, Julia didn't meet him there, then she met him here. This was um, in Pleasanton, a house that, that he named the Hacienda del Pozo de Verona, the house of the wellhead of Verona. And Phoebe Hearst gave her son permission to build it. Uh, she said, just don't make it very large. It was in Pleasanton, south uh, east of Oakland. Well, she came out for an inspection tour. She saw this. She was furious. She confiscated it. She moved in. It never was W.R.'s house. He had hired Albert Cicero Schweinfurth to be its architect. But sadly, Schweinfurth died in 1900 of pneumonia, very young. And so then Phoebe, by that time, is taking possession of this, and she lived there until her death in 1990. Uh, but so Phoebe hired Julia to continue the work and, and remodel it. So it was at one of those two junctures. But anyway, it was early. It was early um, in her career and in his life. But she, I mean, you know, 40 for him. And, uh, but, but she was already, and, and 30 for her, for, or 31, she was already getting important commissions like this bell tower at El, the El Campanile, which was at Mills, the Oakland College for Women. It's a 72-foot high tower using bells that were from the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. And um, for its time, 1904, it was a rocket ship. It was so high tech. Uh, you know, it was the latest sort of architectural style of mission revival, as we call it today. Um, well, it was a very sturdy building, and Julia did understand engineering, and this proved to be incredibly important. Uh, because in April of 1906 came the worst earthquake ever reported in, uh, ever recorded in North America. And 500 people died, perhaps even more, but thousands upon thousands of buildings were destroyed in San Francisco, including the Fairmont Hotel, which is a brand new building. It had only been open for about 10 days. And Julia was commissioned to re-engineer it. And, and she said that she worked at night in a job shack. And I wonder if it wasn't just those two little buildings right in the middle of the of screen there. She said rats jumped over her feet as she worked at night. She had to stabilize the building before she could move in to make an office, you know. So she single-handedly uh, took on this restoration and um, on April 18th of 1907, the one-year anniversary, the Fairmont Hotel opened. First building restored from the earthquake. Brand new, magnificent, uh, looking as it did, but sturdy and engineered. And of course, it looks exactly like that now. So she, from the beginning, uh, had prominence, but she took all sorts of clients. She really had a policy of never turning down a client, and many of those hundreds of buildings are of this kind. This is in Berkeley, two kind of what we would call in, on the West Coast um, 
uh, First Bay tradition, this kind of woodsy arts and crafts style of the East Bay. Lots of people looked at San Francisco, no functioning utilities, dreadful weather, small lots, and they just moved to the East Bay and didn't leave, you know. So Julia designed buildings like this uh, uh, all over the East Bay Hills. And just to give you a sense of interiors, because that's another thing uh, uh, that where Ju Julia and Edith really um, uh, come together, is that Julia hated working with interior designers and she wanted to, she felt it was intrinsic just as, as Edith Wharton did, that the outside and the inside had to be planned with the same level of meticulousness. You had to work from a plan, you had to conceive it first. And so just to give you an idea of some of Julia's interiors, this is another home, uh, the Goddard House in Berkeley. But so it's an arts and crafts style, very warm. And the thing that really uh, e exemplified Julia's arts and crafts uh, buildings was their relationship with the out of doors. Um, the Bell House, which she designed in 1911 in Berkeley, she often had these sunny windows illuminating um, uh, staircase landings. But it's not, it was not uncommon for a client to hire her once and then for three more things, you know, because she was, she was so impressive. She never advertised. She was just incredibly impressive. And, um, oh, what did I hit? Um, there we go. Uh, but she didn't only build uh, in this small style. And what she really was known for, and I think this is both good and bad, uh, certainly in the 70s and 80s she was denigrated for this, she didn't have an architectural style. You couldn't look at her buildings and say, oh, that's a Morgan, like you could say, a, oh, that's Henry Hobson Richardson, or oh, that's Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, she built what the client wanted, whatever that was. And um, uh, Mr. Lombard in Piedmont, which is between Oakland and Berkeley, a very uh, wealthy enclave, had this watercolor, uh, 19th century watercolor of Croydon, England, and he said to her, would you build me a house that's based on this watercolor? And she did. It's 10,000 square feet. No, I'll go back so you can see. So the gables have shifted. They were on the right. Now they're on the left. But, you know, there's uh, the, coin, the coining, which is the, the you know, the multicolored bricks and the brick chimneys and, and that oriel window, which is uh, sticking out. You know, you'll see all, all of those things here in this 10,000 square foot house. So she had many distinguished uh, commissions. Uh, but she, uh, probably her biggest client besides William Ryder first was the YWCA. And she designed 13 buildings at a place called Asilomar, which means refuge by the sea, and may, maybe some of you know it. It's south of Monterey in Pacific Grove. The YWCA was an incredibly important social movement at the turn of the century. When young women moved out of their family farms, they needed somewhere to live that was safe as they were, became secretaries and nurses in a city. And of course, the boarding houses were full of traveling salesmen and terribly unsavory. And so the YWCA was born to support that. And Phoebe was a, another great um, philanthropist to it. But the girls would save up all year long doing hay rides and rummage sales and, and skits and things. And then they got 10 days, like a conference, out of Selimar. And so it's a compound, one of the largest arts and crafts compound in the country. These, uh, it's, and you can still stay there. It's, uh, it's owned as a state park, and it's be been beautifully preserved. But Julia designed, as I say, more than a dozen buildings. This is the Grace Dodge Chapel, and here's the interior. So really kind of classic arts and crafts where you see the structure. But the biggest issue is, I mean, it, it was a chapel, but what's at the back? A window, because it's built right on the water. And so it it's always was the case, as it was with Edith Wharton, that the view uh, was was the seminal thing that determined everything else. The, the, the decoration, the climate, the setting, it was all about the view. But in spite of all of this work, she was still doing commissions for um, WR. Uh, he hired her to build a, design a country house for him in Sausalito, but they never built it because he didn't have the money. He was in a bit of a kind of Prince Charles position, you know, with his mother uh, holding the purse strings. Uh, for a number of years until her death in 1919. But um, Julia did design for him a, a bungalow on the south rim of the Grand Canyon before it, it was a national park. And, and then WR asked her to build this. So it's quite a jump, this 100,000 square foot Los Angeles Examiner building, which was both offices and a newspaper printing plant. Uh, but he had a complete faith in her. And um, it's just been recently restored. It's a beautiful building on uh, 11th and Broadway in downtown Los Angeles. I doubt, though, that he knew what Julia Morgan was experiencing as she did all this work. Um, in 1913, her youngest brother, Sam, the one successful Morgan male, the happy-go-lucky one, who'd loved to be a fireman, had become a captain, and he was being driven to a fire. And his uh, subordinate drove straight in front of a streetcar. Sam was ejected, horribly injured, but because he was strong, he lingered for six months before dying at the age of 33. That was in 1913 when she's working on this building. 
Um, then her oldest brother, Parmalee, died in 1918, and Ruth, my assistant, and I, we couldn't find the death certificate. And we couldn't really figure out what, why. Um, she had to do a lot of hunting. When she finally found it, we had assumed he probably died of the flu. It was 19, fall of 1918. No, she found it. And the surgeons had listed the cause of death as cerebrospinal lose, which is another name for syphilis. Neurosyphilis, the worst kind of syphilis that kills you an inch at a time until you've lost everything, all your faculties. And though Parmalee was married, he had a wife, he had a seven-year-old daughter, he had three living siblings, he had both of his parents, the name on the death certificate was Julia's. And one, you know, we have interviews with her former guests and staff, and, and one of them had said, you know, she worked so hard and she spent so much time down in Pasadena. And I thought, doing what? Because she built the YWCA there, but not until 1923. Well, that's where Parmalee was. He was at the Las Encinas Sanitarium, and she was down there all the time helping him in his last years. So she, uh, you know, and I don't think the WR, I'm sure, I mean, I didn't know this after 30 years. I don't think the WR was aware of any of these things. But that's the backdrop to, to have in your mind when the collaboration with William Randolph Hearst begins. Phoebe died in April of, of 1919. WR inherits the fortune. He walked into her office and was overheard. It was late in the evening. He said he had a high voice, and it carried. And he said, Miss Morgan, I'm tired of camping. It's Nancy me, and his family had bought it when he was two in 1865. He said, um, I'm getting old for tents, and I'm thinking of building something. You know, will you, a bungalow, six months, he says, six months. So, um, they, you know, it went on for 28 years. But this remarkable collaboration, and in a way, in a real way, there, Edith Wharton has more in common with W.R. than she does with Julia Morgan, because she was the, he was the same kind of exacting client who was involved in every small decision and uh, was assiduous about the pri priorities, you know. Um, but anyway, their collaboration was extraordinary. And not only do we have those almost 2,500 letters I mentioned to you, but uh, there are 10,000 drawings as well. And so it's one of the most documented, I mean, it's one of the longest collaborations in American history, 1919 to 1947, but also one of the best documented ones. And so at the bottom here, this is her scheme, because very soon, within a month, as her employees said they were going on the grand scale, which was the scale WR always went on. Um, but anyway, um, she's saying, you know, what do you think of this? They, they decided on a compound of, uh, uh, in the Spanish colonial uh, revival taste and with the main building like a church, a specific church, just like um, the mount is based on, uh, you know, Belton Hall, with and ha and shares its uh, pediment and its two projecting outer wings. Um, the San Simeon was based on Santa Maria la Mayor, a church in Andalusia, which had one tower. And hers wasn't religious, but he wanted this feeling of a Spanish hill city. So at the bottom, uh, she's written, you know, what do you think of this? And on the side, he's written, well, I like it, and uh, but I think that the arch detail on the right hand guest house, which was going to be his, there are these three cottages, um, should be moved and put in the center house. And so she changed it. That's a, a, a watercolor of hers. And they started with these cottages. They were under construction from 1920 to about 1924, and then began the main building in 1922. She's working in the most modern materials, but this was the back side of beyond, you know. I mean, it was, it's not central now. But, uh, but she, it was a two-hour drive just from San Luis Obispo train station, which is where she'd come in from her San Francisco office, usually at least twice a month. So this is Casa del Sol, the house of the sun. And um, one of the earliest letters that W.R. wrote to her says, Miss Morgan, the main thing at the ranch is the view. Well, everything is predicated on it. And so here you see that's Donatello's David, a copy of it, and um, this uh, fountain, which was based on one in the Boboli Gardens. Uh, but it's all modern marble. Now, I, uh, you see the triple arches up there. Now, I'm going to reverse it so you can see the view. There's David and the Bougainvillea. And another thing, Edith Wharton felt that gardens aren't something you go to. You know, they surround the house. And, and the, the gardens were built alongside. They are integrated entirely into the house and into this uh, scheme. And... Um, Julia did say to those friends, Pierre and Lucy, she said, I now look on all hilltop castles of Europe with a great sense of sympathy and understanding for their builders because uh, stuff had to come in either by boat, the deep water port, San Simeon Bay, and then get hauled up the hill or be a, a, were arrived by truck and then be carried up uh, you know, in the beginning by chain-driven Mack trucks that are going a mile an hour after they you know, retire the mules and the wagons. She's got to build the road. I mean, so it was everything. And we know because a taxi driver told us her, uh, what her first visit was like. 
um, it was still April. I mean, Hearst lost no time. You know, the same month his mother had died, he, he asked her to come down. So she took the train to San Simeon and arrived at dawn, and WR was waiting there in a taxi. And they took the two-hour drive up to San Simeon at the bottom of the hill to where the road stopped. And at the stop, there were two saddled horses. And Julia looked at him. She said, I don't ride, and I'm not going to learn. You know, And, you know, she's wearing this big wool, long uh, uh, skirt. She put... Uh, trousers on underneath it so she could climb scaffolding but she's you know she, anyway wr had been born on a horse so what they did was um keep her in the taxi put him on the horse ask another couple of cowboys to come over and steve zagar the taxi driver gunned it and drove that taxi straight up 1600 feet to the hilltop avoiding the large rack outcroppings but when they couldn't make it the cowboys roped the bumper and pulled it so, you know, she didn't need this economically. I mean, she didn't have to say yes, but uh, she always said yes. And it became, uh, you know, this really uh, extraordinary. It was, a, it was a kind of a love affair, if you consider, you know, it was all platonic. But they had a passion of the mine, and they loved the California landscape. And it's so low here, but <laughs> you can see. Uh, it, so when it, it never was finished, but the, the ultimate size, the main building, Casa Grande, this main house, as they call it, had 115 rooms, counting the bathrooms, and 48,000 square feet, plus a 15,000 square foot basement underneath it. And then the three cottages, which are, uh, you know, array, arrayed around the front, with facing the mountains, Casa del Monte, the sun. That's when I showed you Casa del Sol, and the and the sea, Casa del Monte, on the far side. And then you see the little blue spot. That's one of the two magnificent swimming pools she designed. But it really does look as if Spain had never relinquished, <laughs> you know, California. It's, just, it's an absolute uh, fantasy. And they thought a lot about how it would look on the hilltop, you know, from the bottom of the hill, from the top. And it's wonderful to have this lively um, uh, correspondence between them. And um, the way that she did this, she still had her full-time job in, in San Francisco. She'd take, on, on Saturday, which was a work day, she'd take the um, uh, ferry to Oakland. And then she would... Um, take the train down to San Luis Obispo on Saturday night. She'd arrived before dawn on Sunday. Go up in the taxi with Steve Zagar 568 times. That's the number of trips. And um, work all day that Sunday, often with Hearst there, conferring. And then do it all in reverse. You know, before dawn on Monday morning. I mean, she's back in San Francisco. And she took an employee once, and he said, I was exhausted, you know. And she went right into the office. She didn't spend the night. She hardly ever spent a night at San Francisco. She didn't have a bedroom. If she might stay, if she wanted to check the height of the shaving mirrors or how smoothly the closets worked or something. But she, that's how she did it. You know, she slept and drew on the train. So she was remarkable uh, for the level of energy and the level of involvement because just again, like Edith, she was both the landscape architect and the interior designer as well as the architect. And though she didn't engineer this building, she worked very closely with those who did and she understood engineering. And Casa Grande itself is made entirely of steel reinforced concrete. Um, though it was faced with, um, then the, that's the bell tower is based on Santa Maria la Mayor, uh, but it was faced with a Manti limestone from Utah, so it looks as if it's all block. And the impression that one would get, I mean, she did say this about Hearst. She said, he does suffer from a great changeableness of mind, <laughs> for which he compensates by letting me change mine now and then. Uh, but he was, uh, as you probably know, uh, one of the most voracious collectors and he bought the best and what he liked the best. And you might think that he owned everything first because that's what it looks like. They, they laid it out in a field and then they made a house. Less than 5% of the thousands of objects which Phil San Simeon were in Hearst's possession prior to building. So it's all about this balance that has to be done retroactively to keep everything in harmony, even though the expansions are continuing. This is the refectory where they dined. She had to make this ceiling. It's made up of, of panels of 16th century saints that were once across a wall in Italy. Um, and uh, she had the fireplace is from a, a French cloister that W.R. bought in Marciac, France. Now, he's not buying these things in Europe, generally. It's between the World Wars and the American Congress in 1909 passed the Payne Aldrich Tariff that said if it's 100 years old and a work of art, you don't have to pay duty. And during and after the war, it opened the floodgates. That's when most of our American museums really got their principal collections. And so W.R. is at the auction houses of, uh, you know, and working with dealers. But anyway, that fireplace from uh, this cloister in Marciac was only 11 feet high. And the room's 20, 27 feet high. So, um, you know, she's put in uh, antique elements, uh, pressed them into the concrete to make it fit. And the, the real sort of uh, unseen hand on this was Stanford White. 
and uh, who died in 1906, or WR definitely would have hired him, uh, the center of, the, well, this whole ceiling, which is in a guest suite called the Doja Suite, was in Stanford White's Gramercy uh, apartment in, um, in New York City. And White was the one who said, America's the new Rome, and like all conquering countries, we can take the art of Europe and we can improve on it by mixing it together in this distinctive, idiosyncratic American style, which of course also, I mean, just because the outside looks like an English manor house, the inside doesn't, you know, so that's, that, that whole idea. The goal isn't authenticity, the goal is effect. The central panel by Joaquin Vaudeville is 17th century, the cartouches around it are 18th century, and around that is a bunch of modern wood. They had the wormers drilling holes to make the new match the old. And not with a sense of, of deception, but just with this feeling of, you know, integration and um, plan, he, he collected uh, voluminously, but he did have several excellent collections, silver, uh, antique ceilings, the, this is a 17th century Spanish one in the, one of the two libraries, since this is, has a marvelous library. I'll tell you, WR had two libraries, there's 8,000 books in total, and all of the contents were given along with the house after WR died, everything together, with a con by the, from the Hearst Corporation and family, with a condition we never complete it or alter it. But anyway, Greek Faces was another one of his magnificent uh, collections. He had 450 and displayed many of them in the library. Uh, so she's involved with the landscaping, and this is a drawing she's made of herself and William Randolph Hearst, it looks like to me, two people that bear strong physical resemblances. It's a suggestion for a feature opposite House B, which was their name for the House of the Mountains. But anyway, th there's not an aspect of the gardens that she's not involved with. And an interesting thing happened um, in 1925. They started it as a completely Spanish house. And then Julie writes to him, she says, I'm sending you a book. It's going to your room in the Ambassador Hotel. Well, she doesn't say the title because she knows the title. But the next letter from her said, you know, I think the way that we differ from these Italian villas is that our terraces are too small. We need to redo them. Well, they redid every single terrace at San Simeon after 1925. And I don't know that it was Edith Wharton's book, but I, um, well, I'll, I'll keep on with the evidence and see what you think. Um, this terrace, the Earring Terrace, looks out on the view. He owned that view. He owned all that land. It was a 450-square-mile ranch in, originally. But so the land and the setting are paramount. Julia's also doing things like the zoo. Uh, she's feeding uh, Marianne the elephant. The warehouses, because, of course, they have to store the things they're shipping down at San Simi. This is still a working cattle ranch for the Hearst family, and it's still an estate village at the bottom of the hill. She designed beautiful houses that are now owned by the head of the ranch, I mean, resided in by the head of the ranch and the cow boss, and it's very rare. Every great house had an estate village, but they're almost all gone, you know, but San Simeon, uh, they continues to function beautifully. But the other way in which she understood the beauty of, of landscape and the mesmeric effect of water would be in her two swimming pools. And though we don't know if Julia Morgan ever knew how to swim, she designed breathtaking pools. And this is called the Roman Plunge. There were tennis courts on the roof, which is why you see skylights coming down. It's all designed in Murano glass from the glassmaking island near Venice. And with you see on the diving platform there, uh, the gold. So um, it's 22 karat gold uh, fused into clear glass. And then the rest is lapis. Um, and it had a historical precedent, and that is a 5th century mausoleum in Ravenna called Gala Placidia, where you see the lapis blue glass and the gold mosaic tile. But it's like a shining mirror. It, it, it is an extraordinary uh, building. And where, uh, where Edith says, uh, you know, structure supersedes ornament, not ornament structure. That's true for Julie Morgan's work as well. These are structural beams that you see so beautifully uh, decorated in this literally fantastical style. We don't know if she ever set her foot in anything bigger than a bathtub, but she certainly understood. And, and they were done in this Italian vein because they really changed. Uh, and, and all the terraces got wider and they started looking at Italian precedents. This is an illustration in Edith's book of the Temple of Asclepius at the Villa Borghese. Here's the temple at the Neptune pool. And when it was originally designed, because this is her outdoor pool, I'll go back here. The Temple of Asclepius has four columns across the the front. The Neptune pool was going to have four columns. Uh, these are six columns from different buildings, and the two outer ones are shorter and thicker, and so they ended up making it six across, but it was going to be four across. This Neptune pool, which was three and a half to ten feet deep, heated with kerosene, uh, holding 345,000 gallons of water, was called by the great architect Charles Moore a grand liquid ballroom. 
for the gods and goddesses of the silver screen because it, everything they generated their own power hydroelectrically. Everything was beautifully uh, lit at night and still is today. They have evening tours. And this goal of effect is so extraordinary. Then comes another letter. Nobody is saying Wharton or Italian Villas, but W.R. says, I really like those figures in that um, garden of Caparola. And why don't we do something like that, Miss Morgan? But instead of vases on their head, because this is from Edith's book, um, let's make it lamps. So these cast stone lamps were created. Uh, and you see how they ascend with the staircases and they frame the Neptune pool, which has columns from antiquity, 17th century statues, and then art deco nymphs with page boy hairstyles in these white marble uh, sculptures which they commissioned from Paris. So I feel like it's an unseen hand but of, of Edith uh, that they're using. And, and of course, well, Julia's office was a library in San Francisco. She would peruse books with her clients. So that's how important historic precedent was. Marion Davies was, of course, the woman with whom Hearst lived for 30 years. And while this is all going on, he couldn't marry her because his wife uh, was unwilling to divorce. But she lived in at 137 Riverside Drive and at Van, um, Alva Vanderbilt Belmont's house, which was called Beacon Towers in Long Island. She re renamed it St. Jones. Um, but anyway... Um, Julia designed for Marion this beach house, which is now gone, but also this beach cottage, beautiful uh, Georgian building with its real Hollywood touches and uh, in all of the bathrooms. And of course, Marion was the animating spirit. But that's going on. This is going on. I showed you the font inside. There's a font outside of this Chapel of the Chimes, which is, I don't know how many square feet. I wouldn't be surprised if it was something like 20,000. I mean, it's huge and absolutely gorgeous medieval. This is the center um, of, of the corridor. She's also designing at the same time these buildings are between 27 and, and 1929. The, the Beach House, the Chapel of the Chimes, and this Berkeley Women's City Club, which is 48,000 square feet, six floors, and was th her largest women's club, still there. And you can stay there and eat there. Uh, it's on Durant. And the ground floor of the six-story building is the swimming pool that's on the cover of my book. And she designed more than 30 pools, and they're all magnificent. But the structure of this one, this is the ground floor. There are five concrete stories that have to rest on this thing. And as I said last night, it's like putting bricks on a doily, you know, as far as trying to make it stick. So um, she's really still doing such amazing work. And then in 1930, wind tune burned to the ground, the one I showed you. WR hires her to replace it. She designs these Bavarian houses that are magnificent. You can't go now because the Hearst Corporation still own it and the Hearst family still use it. But this, on, a, on that river, the rushing McLeod River, this is Cinderella House. Oops, what did I do again? Straight out of Bavaria and with these murals by Willie uh, Pogany, <coughs> children's book illustrator. And WR lived in um, Brown Bear House with Marion Davies. So you couldn't find two more remote places in California than, than this, this 100,000 acre forest in the middle of nowhere in, you know, on the coast of central California. And she's doing all of that work and it was too much. You see her face drooping there. She ended up really ruining her health and she had a mastoiditis and recurring since childhood, ear infections, no antibiotics. Finally, the botched operation came. They took out her entire inner ear. She lost her equilibrium and she was facially disfigured. She kept working. She never stopped working. One of her staff wrote to another, most of us would throw ourselves into the ocean. Um, the one building she wasn't able to bring to fruition that she collaborated on with Hearst was this. He bought two 12th century Cistercian monasteries in Spain, one in 1926 and one in 1931. This is in that era before the Spanish Civil War, uh, during the ferment of the Second Republic. These had been secularized in the 19th century, so they're owned by private owners. One's a, a stable and one's a wheat field. Anyway, Hearst had the stones taken apart, Julia sent an employee there, boxed, numbered, tens of thousands, and shipped first to New York and then to San Francisco. And his plan was to make a West Coast Cloisters and build it in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco between the De Young Museum and the Japanese Tea Garden, but it was never built. The stones were vandalized, the crates were burned. There are still stones just sitting, 12th century limestones, that are sitting in, uh, in Golden Gate Park. And uh, in... Uh, about 15 years ago, the Abbey of the Order of New Clairvaux, which is a, a Cistercian order, um, took the, enough stones from the chapter house, put them together with old and new to give us a sense, but it would have been on the level of the cloisters, which, of course, was built in the 30s, and they were planning this in the 30s. So that last great work uh, never came to fruition. Julia's younger brother, Avery, with whom she was so close, suffered from middle uh, life, really, in his 40s, from early-onset dementia, which got worse and worse. She 
uh, cared literally for him um, all his life. He became her chauffeur when he couldn't work anymore. Um, but he wandered, and finally he died in 1943. They found his body nine months later, dead of starvation and exposure, lying in a field. And, that, and, and when, just after the war, Julia started exhibiting the same symptoms of dementia. She knew what that meant. And, um, you know, she began to travel until she got lost and left behind on a freighter in Spain. You see her here on the left. Her family said she only traveled when she couldn't build. She's looking away. She's saying, take the picture already. You know, she was steadfast about resisting interviews. And she, all she wanted to do was what she loved, and that was, uh, you know, to work. Uh, she, W.R. died at age 88 in 1951, and he, he wanted the, the castle, Hearst Castle, to go to Cal. Like the big family, they, they were offered it. They turned it down as a gift. Too expensive, too far from anything. And not really in a style in 1951 that people were so in, much enjoying with modernism, you know, the, the, the rain. Um, so anyway, it became a state park in 57, but too late for Julia Morgan. Um, she died that year at the age of 85, and her last five years had been really un, in the grip of dementia. Um, the, the castle opened in, on June 2nd of 1958, and the year before, Life magazine uh, ran a great big 14-page story with lots of color photographs. Finally, this house you always wondered about, anybody can see, you know. Lots of text, lots of interviews. Julia Morgan's name was never mentioned. And in 1966, when Joan Didion did her essay called A Return to Xanadu, which was about nothing but her childhood visits to San Simeon and comparing them with her visits as an adult, Julia Morgan's name was never mentioned. So it's hard to believe, you know, that she could have become so obscure. Time kind of passed her by, and she never wanted fame. Um, but she did save all those papers. And I, I, again, I see the parallels with Edith Wharton. She, Julia Morgan wasn't a writer, but she was a writer of letters and a writer of diaries. And just like here at the Mount, we end up with people who really lived Sorry, <laughs> they lived outside their time. Here's Edith um, in 1923 getting the first honorary doctorate from Yale, and Julia in 1929 getting the second honorary doctorate ever awarded to a woman. I mean, that's what I meant to a woman, you know, Edith to a woman and Julia to a woman um, from the University of California. And so they both left us an incredible legacy of words and buildings and inspiration. Thank you. <laughs>